Hey, Jerry, you know, if you would just make sure you got the boys to bed on time, that would help me so much in the morning. I just can't believe that you can't think that through for yourself. So if I was able to do that, then you could be happy. I could be happy if you would just pull it together. Okay, well, if you would just be happy, then I could be happy. We are talking about expectations today and what they bring into your lives and what you want to get rid of them with your life. Real life for real families. Hurts, habits, and hangups happen in every family. Jerry and I are here with tools to help you trust God, clean house, and tell the truth to ramp up the joy in your family. You have what it takes. It's time to become sober on purpose for, for his, his purpose. purpose. We have an expectation that you guys are going to help us get a second mic. I didn't even talk about what we were going to be uh, speaking on today, and that is expectations after sobriety. So. We're both sober, uh, chemically sober, and I like to define sober as rational. And I think for the most part, we're rational. I'm trying to feed a lot of content into our limited amount of time together here. (laughs) And we do have limited amount of time. One of the things that uh, we looked at as we began to get sober was who are we now and what are our expectations for each other? And that was pretty hard to face up to. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, expectations, particularly when associated with others' actions or inactions or just having expectations of how the world is going to work or how other people are going to interact with us, they are uh, a source of resentment. And uh, unless, of course, once in a while you turn out to have your expectations fulfilled. But expectations as a rule are just something that we're a trap we're setting for ourselves as we walk down the journey of the sober life. One of the phrases that really catches me is if he would just take out the trash, if he would just make more money, if he would just stop using drugs, then my life would be okay. And that's me leaving my life in the hands of someone else. I don't think God intended that other than himself. We don't need somebody else to work their program correctly for us, for us to be happy. Yeah. Tanya is a card-carrying member of Al-Anon, and one of their big mantras is that they can be well while the addict is still using. Is that right? That is right. And so not only can we be well, we can be happy even if the alcoholic is still practicing. And that sounds odd, probably sounds extremely odd to those of you who are battling in the thick of it right now. It is the idea that I can be well within myself no matter what the circumstances are outside of me. And that means dropping the if they would just expectation. I don't need them to if they would just for me to be happy and work my program. I need to focus on what's important to me and me being healthy. And when we talk about that, we look at, well, okay, as a relationship addict, what does that really mean? It means that the only thing that I can control is myself. And if I expect somebody else to create the life that I want, I may be waiting a really long time. Now, and I just kind of had a little epiphany, if you will. And I'm going to talk through this. And if it doesn't sound right, I'll make sure to say, well, that that isn't consistent. But what I just kind of came to in my own mind was, that if we set expectations for ourselves in the way we're going to behave, they're not really expectations in that regard. They're more like boundaries. And we're setting a personal boundary that I'm not going to use today, or I'm not going to let that person get me angry or triggered today. Those, I think, are better defined as, as personal boundaries. And we do have the ability to control the way we act or the way we react or, or what we do. And even if we're put into a high pressure situation where we're going to do something that we may not have chosen to otherwise, it's still a choice and it's still something within our control. What I struggle with is I'm a little bit of the opposite in that if you ask me to do it, then I value you more than I value me. And I won't hold my promises to myself rather than not holding them to you. And so that's a little different as far as expectations are concerned, because I expect an enormous amount out of myself and then I fail continually and then I just keep digging myself a hole. So that leads me into something I learned 
uh, just a little while ago that expectations are breeders. If I expect you to do something and then I expect a little bit more and then I expect a little bit more and I think you felt this way in our relationship that no matter what he does, it's not enough. It's not right. He's never quite met the expectation that I have. Okay. No, I, I mean, that's, that's sometimes when we get into a fuss, that's like, what you say to me is make a list. I know there's going to be more. If you say this is my expectation of you, there's got to be some more that you're going to ask for and then more that you're going to ask for. Uh, yeah, I suppose there's some truth. There's definitely some truth to how I've reacted in that regard. Although I think we're starting to digress off the particular topic. So just for definition's sake, let's when we talk about expectations today or going forward, Let's make sure that we're all on the same page, that we're, we're, we're defining the expectations that we have, how other people or the situations in our life are going to be. Make sense? Yes. And what see, what I was describing was if expectations just keep having this endless cycle and you can never win, which I think a lot of people feel, especially with a relationship addict like me, of if I can't control you completely, then then I'm not happy. And if you're not happy, then I'm not happy. And if I'm not happy, then I need to make you happy. And it just keeps making this endless cycle that why play? If you can't win, why play? If, if every time you're not going to be able to meet the expectations, then a lot of people just roll over and say, okay, I'll be over here doing my thing because there's nothing that's going to please you. Yeah, I guess I do agree with that. So if somebody who's setting expectations for somebody else, it's unlikely that they'll ever be able to live up to the expectations, particularly because the goalposts can move consistently. But also, if we're setting expectations then for other people in our lives, then uh, we're missing the, the target here, which is that's not within our control. Well, and I think... In our relationship, that moving goalpost has been a real big issue, that once you reach the goalpost, it suddenly is halfway down the field, however long a football field is, I don't know. But that's one of the things that I learned early on as I was working in my program was, I, and this crosses into boundaries, and we will talk about boundaries, but I expected Jerry to be home for dinner. Or I expected Jerry to be home at a certain time for bed. Or I expected Jerry not to sleep with the TV on. And some of those things are just coming from different family backgrounds. But these expectations breed into the next expectation, which lights up into anger and frustration. Because I'm not accepting what is. I'm expecting things to change. And if anybody out there has ever tried to change somebody else, it is it's a Sisyphean effort. You just keep rolling the rock up the hill and it keeps rolling back down on top of you. Yeah. <laughs> you have to come up with a little more to say there, buddy. <laughs> I think I squeezed all my content into the first couple of minutes of the podcast. Well, let's go into a little bit more specifics on expectations and how we can, what tools we can use to try and avoid setting them. Well, I think the first is, as part of the serenity prayer says, to accept the things I cannot change and the courage to change the things I can. And the first part of that is to figure out what the things are that you can't change. Right. Where are those? And stop fighting those battles because that's where I spent a lot of time. And I sat in rooms and I've done it where people were driving around looking for whoever was using, trying to stop them from using. They spent an enormous amount of time running somebody else's life instead of accepting that that was that another person is not somebody they can change and they need to figure out what it is they need to be healthy. Yeah, I had a friend who used to say, who told me once, you know, one of the tools that he used in early sobriety was to say, accept the things I cannot change, which is people, places, the circumstance. Change the things that I can, my decisions, my feelings, or uh, how I react to certain situations and my attitude and the wisdom to know the difference. Now, that's, I think, the crux of the whole situation is how do we know the difference? Well, and that's where I think there's a couple tools that really come in and I'm going to say the word journaling and lots of people are going to just lose their minds because people don't write, but it doesn't have to be a written journal. We all have cell phones now. It could be a recorded something 
There's a 10th step app. There's a fourth step app that you don't have to use exactly how it's set up, but it is just a recurrence of the day so that you could say, oh, that went well. That didn't go well. I'd like to do that again. I wouldn't like to do that again. And that will at least begin to get you on the path of things that you cannot change. Now, my own personal story with that is I missed that line in the serenity prayer for probably the first two years I was saying it because I didn't believe there were things that I could not change. That took a lot of maturity for me to come to that place that I was willing to say, okay, there are some brick walls. There are some things that I don't even want to change if I could. You have to come to some level of maturity that says there are some things that are out of my control, which you talk about in a later episode where you just have to realize that you're not God. I do. (laughs) I'm going to. Is that what you're telling me? I'm going to. So you have an expectation that I'm going to talk about this particular. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And so with these expectations, the the next thing would be, I have often called a a trusted friend, a sponsor, somebody else, when I'm stewing in my expectations of he should be home by now, he should have had dinner on the table. That was a big one for us. When I worked all day, I expected him to have dinner on the table. And I've called a friend and I've said, if I weren't crazy, meaning if I weren't caught up in my relationship addiction, how would I act? Yeah, I've heard it said, how, how would a normal person react to this situation? So Tanya touched on something I feel very strongly about and is not something that I've been practicing as well as I might like to recently, which is this idea of having, and, and traditional 12-step would be referred to as a sponsor. Uh, we, we've we heard it said accountability partner, but I personally like trusted spiritual advisor. I think that one works the best, but there's some criteria that this person needs to have. And I'm going to offer these out like they're, suggestions because I don't want to pretend like I have this whole thing figured out, but I would highly suggest that whoever you choose, you know, that one, you have a primary two, they're the same sex. I guess there would be some exceptions to that, but that's a good rule of thumb that I have found in my experience. Three, that they're not afraid to call you on your bull crap. I know when I was weight training very seriously. I was 275 pounds, you know, the strongest I'd ever been in my life. It was very difficult for me to find somebody who wasn't afraid to look at me square in the eyes and say, I think you're lying to yourself or that doesn't make sense. But, you know, it's possible. You, the, the one person who I did find in my life who was very good at that had a, a really bad back injury, probably 165 pounds soaking wet and about five foot nine. So it can be done. So when we're talking about this, we talked about journaling, we talked about talking it out with somebody else before you get yourself in the, if he would just, could they please, why can't they handle it like this realm? The other thing is to look at your self-talk. Jerry and I have both done it. We've been driving home, coming home for dinner, going to set up with either just Jerry or the boys and have some dinner. And I've already had the conversation in my head. Jerry has already responded to me in my head. I've already gotten angry with him in my head because he's already responded in a way that I didn't like. By the time I walk through the door, I am radiating anger because I've already had this full conversation and come to a conclusion that he's wrong and he had better darn well do what I need him to do. That self-talk is another piece of the examination that lets loose of the expectations. Because the truth is, we don't know what kind of day the other person has had. Yes, you may have talked on the phone, but things change regularly. And our therapist said to us, every time you call somebody, you break into their world. And often you don't realize what they're handling. It may be great. It may not be great. It may be very stressful. It's something that we are in our world pushing onto their world and then expecting them to respond in the way that we perceive they either are or are not going to respond. But we were in such an anger mode that oftentimes those conversations I would have in my head led to me being already angry by the time I got there. So my expectation was he's not done what I've asked him to do or he's not where I expect him to be or things are not happening like I expect. So I might as well go in with sword drawn and shield raised. Expectations are something that happen whether you've dealt with alcohol or any kind of addiction. In sobriety, we have noticed that our expectations seem to get out of control relatively quickly. 
and and spin out of control. And sometimes, if especially if they're not communicated, then we can end up in an argument pretty quickly if we have some idea of what we would like to ha- be happening, but we've only had this conversation in our head and not with the other person, then the expectations are, again, they're just breeders. They keep multiplying like rabbits. Yeah, I, I, I agree with all of that. And I did, of course, think of one more thing that I wanted to cover in that regard, which is, you know, having a resource kit of trusted spiritual advisors is a, is an advisable thing to do because... Oftentimes, even in sobriety, we'll find ourselves in a situation where we really need to deal with something. Uh, we're on a timeline, and our go-to person is not available or has set a healthy boundary because we're being too needy, and we got to reach out to somebody else. And we kind of go down the list of people. But what we need to be careful of, what I need to be careful of when I do that, is to not just cast a super wide net until I get the answer that I'm looking for. That doesn't mean that I have to take the suggestions that are offered to me, if any, by my trusted spiritual advisor, but it does mean that if I ask enough people, I'm eventually going to hear whatever I want to hear that's going to lead me down a path of something that might be unhealthy or something that I'm trying to justify to myself that isn't what would be best for me or to honor my father in heaven, of course. So why, let's back up, this other person, the sponsor, the spiritual director, those types of people come in as a tool for dealing with expectations when we are clouded in our own mind of, is this something that I can do? Is this something that's reasonable to expect of another person? Is this something that is wise to, to ask another person for? So in the early stages of sobriety, it's a lot of a thought process and a lot of gentleness with any party that you're dealing with. The feelings are exposed, the expectations, there's no real clarity on what that is, and accepting the things I cannot change. Like I told you, I thought I could change just about anything if I pushed hard enough, worked hard enough, made enough money, did the right thing, said the right thing, controlled the right people. And that has proven not true over and over again. But I didn't even want to realize that. I mean, I'm in complete agreement. Stop agreeing with me. Well, <laughs> he rarely well, agrees with me in 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 regular daily life. <laughs> well, we're not talking about economics or or social norms or anything like that, so we're good. But uh, I would continue on down the line of when dealing with expectations that um, a trusted spiritual advisor could be somebody we could role play with, hopefully, and who could take the more realistic viewpoint of. We're going to role play out how this conversation is going to go. And they're going to say, okay, I think that's a reasonable thing to ask for. I'm okay with that. Let's do that. And like, well, wait a minute. They they would never say that. Well, you don't know that. You know, I'm I'm doing a back and forth between the, the, the person speaking with their sponsor and then the, the person who's catastrophizing over here about how this conversation is going to play out to the, to the negative and to the detriment of everybody. But how many times in my life, have I catastrophized a particular scenario and it hasn't come true? It's got to be 90, 95% of the time where I imagine the worst possible scenario and it's not the case. As a shade tree mechanic to this day, every time I'm trying to diagnose an issue with a, a motor vehicle or a motorcycle, I'm always going to the worst possible scenario first, as opposed to trying to tackle what the easiest solution might be and the least time consuming one. And I see that in my emotional interactions with myself and with others quite frequently as well. Well, and that that's a really good story. So I drive a 91 Subaru, which I absolutely adore. And for some reason, the running lights were on and we couldn't figure out what that was. And poor Jerry gets out there and it spends about three hours taking the steering wheel off, looking at everything, trying to figure out what's going on. And then you finally decided. Well, let's, let's back up. I had an expectation that the issue had to be within the lighting assembly and the switch. That was my expectation that the switch... The main switch that turns the headlights or the parking lights on had shorted or had stuck or had had a piece that had broken. Based, that on, meant, your, based on your previous knowledge of cars, that's what you expected to have happen. I had no previous knowledge of getting into a vehicle in these particular components. So 
my expectation was that I was going to have to tear into the entire steering column, which is what I ended up doing first. And then what I do, I went to a trusted spiritual advisor, in this case, YouTube, <laughs> and I found out that there's this little toggle switch that's kind of hidden just on, in between the steering column and the dash that whoever the engineer was who put that thing there, I'm not a fan of, but but yeah, it was a toggle switch. You just had to flip it. And after you know three hours of disassembly and an hour of reassembly, I was able to figure out the issue in, in, in about 10 minutes on YouTube, of course. And, but he did that last and he went, I can't believe I didn't YouTube it first. And that's where we're going with expectations is separate out, begin to be gentle with yourself and separate out your expectations from the fact, from the personality and see what it is that might be causing the issue based on expectations. Like I said, the conversation in my head on the way home already had me mad by the time I walked in the door. Jerry's experience with cars had him pulling the steering wheel off because that must be what's leaving the running lights on. Seeking out and teasing it apart will help you grow in learning to take life on life's terms. And that's the difference between expectations and how to live actual life as a normal person is many people, a lot of people take life on life's terms, what it is. They either don't force to change or run away from the change or, and they seek out information before they jump to an expectation or a conclusion. Yeah, we've been throwing around the, the, the word normal because it, it is program talk. You know, in program, we use the word normal a lot and it's ironic really because in 12-step tradition, we don't really believe in normal. In AA groups, I've heard it said a lot of times that normal is just a setting on your washing machine or in your dryer or something like that. <laughs> and, and the idea there is is that nobody's really normal. Everybody struggles with their own things. What we're really talking about is people who put on the presence of not having to struggle with emotional issues or people who seem to not lack the emotional tools to deal with themselves, to be comfortable in their own skin without the use of other self-destructive habits, whatever it be. But I can say letting go of the expectations has made me a lot more comfortable in my own skin. You've been able to let go of your expectations? Uh, not all of them, but a lot of them I've just say, okay, that didn't happen. And I can either pitch a fit about it or walk away or be really disappointed, or I can say that didn't happen. And what's the next right thing to do. I do want to just dig into this a little bit deeper because expectations in my experience always are based on something that I'm afraid is going to threaten one of three core things. One is my wallet, two is my social standing, and three is my sex life. And those are the three things that can really threaten my ego and therefore cause me to catastrophize and set negative expectations. I think positive expectations are the same way where it's going to be like, it's going to affect, I expect this to pan out really well for my wallet or really well for my social standing or really well for uh, my sex life, for lack of a better. And I think for women, it could be wallet, but I think it's more about the breakdown of the relationship. Well, this if this doesn't happen, then the relationship could fall apart. Or if this doesn't happen, then the kids won't get what they need. Or if this doesn't happen, then, you know, maybe we can't pay the rent or the electric bill. Or that's where it comes down to the wallet of, of the relationship. And then with the good expectations, you may be expecting, you know, something wonderful to happen. And if it does, that's great. But if it doesn't, are you going to allow yourself to drop into what Jerry's call, calling catastrophizing or the downward spiral that says, okay, I got up this morning and I'm five minutes late, which means the rest of my day is going to be off. Or I was five minutes late, but I corrected that. But then I yelled at the kids. And so now I feel bad and it's going to be a rotten day and the kids will come home and hate me. It's that downward spiral that expectations can not only breed more expectations, they can also take you in that downward spiral. And that's where we're giving you those tools. And we have a tool worksheet that'll go with this about examining those and getting clear on what you're expecting, and what you're accepting. So one of the al slogans is stop expecting, start accepting. It's raining. I don't like rain, 
but it's raining. So I can accept the fact that I'm going to put on my warm boots and my warm clothes. I'm going to minimize my time outside. I'm going to get the kids dressed in a warm way and we're going to go forward. Or I yelled at the boys this morning. I don't like that, but I can accept that it happened. How am I going to make that better for the rest of the day instead of catastrophizing, going down that downward spiral and expecting it just to get worse? In my experience, ego plays a huge role in expectation where I'm expecting my ego to be either damaged or inflated. And humility is my number one tool to diffuse expectation where I would say, I don't know how this is going to play out. I I have been surprised before. This person that I'm catastrophizing about engaging with is a rational, intelligent human being, if that happens to be the situation. In my experience, usually it is. They make rational choices most of the time. I do not know how this is going to go. And if I can show a portion of humility in the way I self-talk, then I can diffuse a lot of my expectations before they get really dug in. Well, and let's come down to the baseline is there are evil people out there and there are people who are out to damage you. I would say probably 98% of the time you're dealing with somebody who has their own issues and they're trying to get their own things squared away and they're not out to harm you. And we know in the base that God is out for our good, that all these plans are out for our good. And accepting those and saying, I will roll with what's here and take life on life terms and make my attitude the best it can be is beginning to unbundle those expectations. Yeah, if we go further and down the serenity prayer, there's a line that says, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace, trusting that he will will make all all things things right right if I surrender to his will. Uh, But the point is, we never see in a program, we never really see the full uh, Richard Reinhold Niebuhr serenity prayer. We only see the front part. Well, except in Celebrate Recovery. In Celebrate Recovery, you see the whole thing. And that's really important because it does accept life on life's terms, that there will be hardship, that we will have to work through it. And that is part of bringing us peace, is changing that attitude that God has got this under control. We do not have to fight these battles Every moment of every day. Yeah. And it it may be a bit of a rabbit trail, but uh, I read not too long ago that good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from poor judgment. So it's really our mistakes that we learn from, isn't it? Absolutely. Hey, thanks for spending some of your precious time with us. We don't expect you to do that. But if you want to look us up, we are at thejoyousfamily.com, The Joyous Family Facebook page, The Joyous Family Instagram page, and The Joyous Family Pinterest page, or email us at tanya at thejoyousfamily.com. Jerry has his own set of identifiers, but do not check off his Instagram. Vote for me. Follow me, not Jerry. Unlike Tanya, I expect you guys to go to motocross underscore family. That's my Instagram page. We have an internal contest going on. And it all, and he's winning. It all takes place at motocross underscore family. Make sure you follow me. And there's a monetary reimbursement, but I am really hoping to. Yeah, and here. I'm fronting it. And the joyous family dot com or the joyous family on instagram i need followers over there so i can win we'll look forward to seeing you again next week